most of you know, the preservation of organic material of plant remains can vary a lot uh, according to the locations of your site. But uh, besides fruits, seeds, pollen, um, many plant taxa do also produce phytolids, and as such, they provide you with uh, an additional source of data uh, to deal with what happened with plants. And this, especially where the preservation of plant remains is poor. However, the logic of phytolids analysis differs markedly from that of the other plant remains. At first, and in contrast to pollen, for instance, phytolith are not made to be transported. They accumulate within the plant tissues, and as such, any phytolith deposition rely on process ending in the decomposition of organic matter and in the past, it has been assumed this decomposition occur in situ. And as such, fatally, it would capture a signature of the local vegetation. But we have other differences too. Uh, another point is that fatally, it can accumulate in a lot of different plant forms. <coughs> you can have fatally deriving from leaf, inflorescence, bright, roots, seeds, fruits. This is a major difference too. Moreover, within each organ, you can have several types of phytolids, and this is known as multiplicity. Another aspect of phytolid analysis is that some type of phytolid can be produced by related and unrelated plant taxa. And this is known as redundancies. And basically, to make things quite simple, uh, phytolith looks like a kind of puzzle which can be made of different types of phytoliths. And uh, basically, the major purpose of phytolith is to reconstruct a puzzle. And strangely enough, the common practice to do so is to extract the phytolid from the soil and the sediment. To do so, what people do, we're taking soil samples with a trowel, we put it in a plastic bag, moving to the lab <laughs> where we put the sample into various solution and we stir it. This ends up in a rather systematic mixing of phytolids having potentially different botanical origin. It means that you're mixing phytolid deriving from different organs, from several specimens of plants from different taxa. This approach assumes so that whole phytolids share a common deposition of history which is not obvious when you're dealing with archaeological deposits, and especially as we do, we work in an urban context. Uh, if we're taking the example of the Brussels dark earth, we've been able to decipher, to discriminate about four different sources of phytolith. We have done those associated with the coprolytic material. We also have those associated with burn material. We also observe phytolith within ceramic fragments. And we have also phytolith within the soil matrix. So if we intend to develop some phytolith analysis of the dark earth units, adopting the common practice will not be really the best option for us. Besides mixing phytolith with different botanical origin, we're going also to mix phytolith with different depositional histories and as such creating a kind of artificial signature we need to decipher. However, we have thin section. Thin section preserves the relative distributions of the phytoliths, the relation to the other component, which help us to discriminate between the origin and the depositional history and basically the purpose of, the, of this lecture is to introduce you to the latest development of the phytolith analysis of the thin section. 
but you need to be aware that the data we will be considered came from the analysis of salt in section made of dark earth units, in other words, archaeological units with complex formation process. And it might be assumed here that if such studies could be achieved through the analysis of thin section, it could certainly be done through for other archaeological units with less complex formation histories where the mixing of the material is less marked, if not absent. So the data we will consider comes from 19 dark earth units from medieval and post-medieval period from six archaeological sites all located within the historical center of Brussels. The way we do is that the data we gain came from a scanning of five to five millimeters square that were selected on the thin sections after the macromorphological study, which allows us to focus on the content, vitally content of the soil matrix along the three-step protocols. We first do a systematic record of each distribution pattern. We afterwards do a phytolith inventory of those distributions pattern. And finally, we do a counting of the phytoliths composing each distribution pattern. So, so far within the soil matrix of the dark earth units, we recorded three basic distributions patterns for the fight. They are either isolated, clustered, or articulated. Isolated phytolith are totally disarticulated phytoli, and which are quite widespread on thin section. Clustered phytoliths are a group of phytoliths which are disarticulated. It's not always the same type of phytolith, and they do not always share the same orientation. As to the articulated ones, it's those that maintain the relative distributions they get within the plant tissues in which they were produced. If we consider this model, these patterns, and according to the units you consider, you know, we note that we have a various combination of these distributions patterns and this along varying frequencies, which provide in clear, clearly additional criteria to discriminate between these units. But what we note also is that we do not have any systematic occurrences of the articulated pattern, which is here in green. And this calls for an explanation. If you go back to the basic paradigm <coughs> of phytolith taphonomy, which means an in situ decomposition of plant fragment, we should have, if not a prevalence of the articulated cis pattern, we should at least have a systematic occurrence of it, which is not the case. To our opinion, uh, this is a consequence of the depositional and post-depositional histories of the phytolites, which implies indeed that as you quite concern the isolated and clustered phytolith, you are absolutely not sure about their origin, which can be quite diverse. But when you're dealing with articulated phytolith, you know that you're dealing with phytolith sharing a common uh, botanical origin. You're sure also that we get some in situ plant fragment decomposition with minimal or no post deposition of perturbation. It implies also that your units, the phytoly signature of your units, it's a kind of mixed signature where each distribution's pattern should have a different meaning. And it might be here assumed in terms of past plant covering that the isolated pattern will be a signature of the regional vegetation, whilst the articulated one will be a signature of component of the local vegetation. And as such, emerge another question. Could it be that, that through the scanning <coughs> of the phytolith content of the soil matrix, we could gain data in which we can be statistically confident for any past plant covering reconstruction, either in terms of archaeobotanical research of archaeoenvironment. 
Uh, within the fighterly community, there is no clear agreement about the minimal count size for statistical confidence. It changed according to the research topic, but also according to the one conducting the research. Quite recently, we get some recommendation uh, for any archaeological purpose. 200, uh, counting of 250 fighter, it has been advocated, provided that you conduct a general scanning of the slides in case of rare but significant fighter being present. In terms of any paleo research, 200 ecologically significant phytolites have been recommended. If we now go back to the isolated report we get in the soil matrix, we know that through the scanning of 2 to 5 square, either the 250 recommendation or the 201 is switched for several units, which suggests that you just need to keep on counting till you reach the recommendation. <coughs> but, but, you need to be aware that those recommendations do not rely on any robust statistical recommendation. It's just the general experience of the community. A statistical analysis of our data uh, suggests that by the counting of eight assemblage composed of 80 phytoids, you should be already able to detect large and medium change, but meaningful in one between the phytoid assemblage. This should be sufficient for any plant covering reconstruction. And if we check, if we do go back to our data, we know that for 18 units upon 19 to reach the 80 count size. Again, this suggests that you just need to keep on counting till you reach the recommendation. But by doing so, you will only detect large and medium scale change in past plant covering. Nothing about the small scale change, but as it can be assumed that those small change will be more dealing with the local vegetation, we could have here other issues by considering the articulated pattern we have in the soil matrix. Um, within the phytolith community, the articulated pattern is known as the silica skeleton, and when you go back to the, the publication, they usually count between one to two hundred of them. But it's not clear, no one precise that, if they are considering one to two hundred silica skeleton or if they are considering one to two hundred interloid of articulated fiber. That's, it. That's unclear. Nevertheless, in both cases, such counting are not reached by our approach, neither the 80 concise. But we have other alternatives by considering the articulated pattern. Uh, basically, the articulated pattern provides clear alternative uh, for the morphometrical analysis of the phytolith. That means the measurement of shapes and size to gain botanical identification. Usually, when people <coughs> intend to discriminate between phytolith assemblage produced by closely related taxa, you need to rely on main falling differences in the, main, in the mean of the different morphe you considered. And to be sure about your, your data, being sh you need to measure an adequate sample size of phytolith, which is calculated by this formula. And previous applications of it point out that you need to measure about 50 phytoliths, but you need to do it for four different types which means that altogether you need to consider 200 factors for morphometrical analysis. The only problem with this classical approach is that again it's conducted on isolated factor. It means material extracted from salts and sediments, which means that at first, as you're dealing with isolated factor, you're not absolutely not sure you're dealing with vital area, a common botanical origin. And again, as you've been processing your samples, you're not sure you're dealing with actually sharing a common depositional histories. And clearly, the, uh, the study of articulated phytolith within the thin section allows us to turn around all these issues. And this especially for the botanical identifications of phytolith deriving from the cultivated crops and which are known as uh, <coughs> dendritic. In 2016, we conduct some research, and it appears that by recovering only eight articulated dendritics, 
we reach the level of 30 lobes to be measured, and we've been so able to make some uh, discrimination between selected species of Avene and uh, treated. <coughs> Indeed, for some shape morphy, on, we just need to rely on 30 wave flows to be measured, if not fewer. Um, if we go back to our articulated record, we get in the soul matrix from Brussels. As I said, we get articulated phytolites within 15 upon 19 dark earth e units. Um, among this articulated pattern, it appears that 64% of these phytolites could derive from cultivated crops. We distributed this, all these individual composing the articulated pattern within size categories, less than five phytolites, between five and 10 and more than 10. And you know that the two latest size categories represent about 31% uh, of all the articulated phytolites with, which we get, which implies indeed that gaining uh, articulated systems where 30 wave lobes could be measured is absolutely not uncommon within thin sections of dark earth units. Which is also interesting is that if we go up to 50 wave lobes to be monsieur, we could be dealing with seven of the eight shape morphometry we usually used for botanical identification. And we could be dealing with the aspect ratio round test compactness, which seems to be the most significant shape morphy in terms of botanical identifications for the cultivated crops. So clearly, the phytolite analysis of salt in section provides us with a few alternatives uh, when other plant remains are absent. And it also provides us with a few alternatives to turn around all the classical problem we face when we do phytolite analysis in a classical way. So, just to move to the conclusions of our effort to develop a kind of micromorphological approach to phytolite analysis, the first conclusion is that clearly uh, the phytolite analysis of the salt in sections contributes to document the complex formation histories of the dark earth units and indeed provide us with additional criteria to discriminate between this and <coughs> identif ident identify these dark earth units. But it also provides us with secure source of data for plant, past plant covering reconstruction. And this along adequate size sample to reconstruct the um, isol to reconstruct the regional past vegetation and this based on the isolated this pattern, but we could go in also botanical identification by the means of morphometrical analysis of the articulated systems, and as such, gaining botanical identifications of component of the past plant covering. But you need to be aware, and really to keep in mind, that all these conclusions came out from the study of dark earth units, in other words, archaeological units with complex formation <coughs> process. So it can be really assumed that such conclusions are also valid for other units which less complex formation process. Thank you for your attention.